Thank you, Annika, and good afternoon. Today is Pentecost, the day on which we remember that the Holy Spirit came on 120 disciples of Jesus and, and empowered the church. We can read about that in Acts chapter 2, and we have done so many times before. Uh, today, I'd like to back up a little and ask, empowered for what? What is this Holy Spirit supposed to help us do? Well, there is more than one right answer here. Uh, today, I would like to highlight one answer in the, that the book of Acts gives us uh, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. This is uh, Luke's introduction to his, the story of the church. Acts 1 chapter 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives the disciples powers to be witnesses for Jesus all around the world. The Holy Spirit gives the church power to preach the gospel. That's something we see highlighted in many different ways in the book of Acts. The power is given for a purpose. The Holy Spirit has a purpose in each of us and a purpose for the church as we work together to point people to Jesus. The day of Pentecost points us to one of the purposes we have as the people of God. We see this purpose in Acts 1, verse 8. We see it in the Gospel of Luke. We see it in the Gospel of Mark. But it's perhaps best known to us from the ending of the Gospel of Matthew. And that's where I want to spend most of our time today. Matthew ends his gospel with a passage that's come to be called the Great Commission, as Annika read. Uh, its literary placement at the very end of the book gives it some prominence. Uh, it's, these are the words that Matthew wants us to remember. Matthew is telling us how he wants us to respond to the story he's told about Jesus. It's like he's saying, I've told you what Jesus did and said, and now... What are you going to do with what I've told you? Here's what Jesus wants us to do. And we heard it read by Annika. In this passage, Jesus is giving his disciples a command. Make disciples of all nations. Can an individual keep this command? No, not directly. Individuals simply don't long enough. They don't, they don't live long enough to go to the nations of the earth. We don't have time to learn all the languages and, and make disciples in all the nations. The, the commandment is really given for the church as a whole. It's a collective mission. It's something that Jesus wants his disciples as a group to be doing, working together. Now, the fact that uh, that no individual can do what Jesus says here does not mean we can ignore what he says. Rather, it means that we need to work together. Uh, the church needs to have a global vision, and an individual members need to support the church in that mission. Now, it so happens that our congregation gives support to a missionary in Western Asia, a nation where Muslims are the majority. In addition to that, uh, a part of our, the donations given in the local church here go to support our denomination, which in turn supports quite a bit of work in other nations. So donations here are one of the ways that individual Christians can do what Jesus is commanding here. But uh, even though individual Christians cannot do this by themselves, the command is still given to each individual Christian. It's a, it's a self-perpetuating command. Jesus says to teach all the disciples to obey everything he commanded. And one of the things he commanded uh, is that we should teach people to obey everything that he commanded. Uh, that means each person should be involved, even if indirectly. Each person should be giving something to support the work of the Great Commission. Now, the fact that the passage has a special name of its own, the Great Commission, uh, reflects that the passage is fairly well known. Uh, but some parts are better known than others, and I'd like today to spend a little extra time in some parts that are not as well known. 
the commission itself is surrounded by a Christ context. In verse 18, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's uh, no matter where they go, the disciples are under Jesus' authority. You might say, I have authority over Rome, over Babylon, over India. So go there and make disciples. You don't need their permission because no matter where you go, I'm in charge. The work they do of making disciples is done under the authority of Christ. It's what he wants them to do. And after Jesus gives them in this command, the commission, he reminds them in verse 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And what's the point of saying that? It seems to be a word of comfort. He's offering to help them. Though they might feel all alone in a strange land, Jesus will be with them no matter where they go. So Jesus is at the beginning and the end of the commission. This, this is a reminder that it's his work, his ministry, and making disciples is not just a bright idea that the church had. Uh, we are being commanded uh, to to join Jesus in his ministry, and he will be with us as we do it. Now, Jesus is quite capable of doing it by himself, but he wants to involve us in what he's doing. Uh, if he doesn't need our help, why does he want it? Uh, many people have compared it to a parent asking a young child to help make something the parent can do it easier working alone. But the important thing here is not just the job. It's about a relationship with a child, teaching the child about work and about working with people. Similarly, Jesus involves us in his work, not just because he can boss us around like some slave labor, uh, but he involves us because he loves us. It's good for us to be involved. He, he is doing work in our lives as we are involved in the work that he has assigned us to do. I think a lot of books on the Great Commission miss that important point. Sometimes they present evangelism as a job we have to do, as if Jesus can't do it without us. The focus is on the work, uh, with little attention to the relationship, and with little attention to the work that Jesus is doing in us as we work with him. See, there's, there's something bigger going on here. We're not just worker bees trying to bring more honey to the hive, and eventually we run out of steam and end up crawling on the sidewalk. Uh, no, the, that analogy doesn't work. The, the truth is more like the parent who wants to involve the children in doing some work. When we are involved in doing what Jesus commands here, we need to see not just what we are doing out there, but also see that through our participation in Jesus' work, he is doing something in here in our hearts and minds. It's part of his plan to make us more like he is, to bring us into conformity with what Jesus is. You know, he could do the work without us, but he doesn't want to. He wants to involve us, even though we slow him down and we don't do it very well, well, most of the time, <laughs> there's something bigger going on here. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. As some have said he does not want to be God without us. The Great Commission is part of his plan to bring us into life with him forever. This is part of our preparation. If we want to be like Jesus, we want to want the things that he wants. Well, let's look at some more details. Verse 19 starts with the word, therefore. Uh, Jesus is saying, since I have all authority, I'm giving you this command, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, the Old Testament prophets described a time when all the nations would come to Jerusalem and ask to be taught. Jesus is saying here, don't wait for them to come to you. You take the initiative and go to them. That is, after all, what Jesus did for us. 
He didn't wait for us humans to figure everything out, to figure out that we needed a perfect person to die for our sins and then invite Jesus to come and do it. Uh, no, Jesus came to us when we were still alienated from him, when we were his enemies. He took the initiative, and that's what he told his disciples to do as well. Now, what are disciples supposed to do as they go to all the world? They are to make disciples, more disciples. What is a disciple? That's somebody who learns. That's what the Greek word means, a learner or an apprentice. And what are they learning? Here we might refer to a similar commission found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24 and verse 46. He told them, a couple of the disciples, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So it's a message to all nations described in Luke as a message about repentance and forgiveness. Uh, Luke doesn't present it as a command, but as a prediction. This is what's going to happen. Uh, but it's apparently talking about the same message, the message that goes to all nations. In the Gospel of Mark, we also find it as a prophecy instead of a command. In Mark 13, uh, verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. It's the gospel, the good news, a message of repentance and salvation. Different ways of describing the same thing. And the disciples are to use this message to make disciples of all nations. So the people who accept this message then are disciples, learners. They are learning for one thing about repentance and forgiveness. They're learning about God's grace and his love. So we might paraphrase the Great Commission with kind of an expansion. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell people about repentance and forgiveness. Repentance means to change the way you're thinking. And that, of course, results in a way that we live as well. Uh, but not, not just any change will do. It has to be in the right direction. It has to be in accordance with what's good. The message needs to tell people what to repent from and what to think instead. People really can't understand what forgiveness is unless they have some concept of what they should have done. Uh, where they went wrong, and who they have offended. Uh, forgiveness implies some sort of relationship that needs to be restored. People are not just accepting a word. They are accepting a concept that in some cultures needs to be explained. Matthew's version of the Great Commission tells us a bit more about it when it says in verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the rest of the New Testament, baptism is associated with repentance and forgiveness. And we do this in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That means we're acting as authorized representatives of the triune God. We're proclaiming forgiveness in his name. And forgiveness means that a person's relationship with God is restored. Well, discipleship starts when people repent of thoughts, words, and deeds that disrupt our relationship with God. Or as Paul says, they, they alienated our minds from God. And we are assured by the gospel that thing, these things are not barriers to our relationship with God, and that's good news for all of us. So these are some of the minimal things that learners are learning. That's where disciples start. That's at the point they are first called disciples. Well, what then? Verse 20, verse Matthew 28, 20 says, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We don't just teach what Jesus commanded. We are also to teach people to obey what he commanded, or to keep his commands. I think sometimes we have not done this as much as Jesus wants us to. 
or sometimes we're so afraid of legalism that we're afraid of telling people to obey Jesus. Perhaps it would be helpful to define the term legalism. Uh, legalism is when we think that we can earn our salvation by keeping the law. We come before the judgment seat of Christ and he asks us, you know, uh, in, a, in a parable, uh, why should I let you into my kingdom? And we would respond by saying, well, I've done this and I've done that. Uh, we think that our behavior, our performance, is the ticket to eternal life. But the proper answer is, and the right mindset is that we fall short. We have not done enough. We need mercy. We need forgiveness. We need the, the death of Jesus on our behalf. And it has been done. If we're ever asked what makes us think we can get in, all we can say is, well, by mercy. Knowing in advance that our judge is full of mercy and he's already paid the penalty for us. We know it has already been done. We can point to what Jesus did for us, not to what we have done. We're not saved by what we do, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter what we do. <laughs> for one thing, if we wanted to live like the devil, um, I don't think we would really be interested in living with Jesus. <laughs> Uh, if we're not interested in living like Jesus, then we probably don't want what he's offering. If people don't even want to obey Jesus, I think that's a non-starter uh, for several reasons. If people don't care whether their thoughts are good or bad, whether their behavior is good or bad, they're not even going to get started. Yeah. Legalism is thinking that we can earn our way into eternal life, but that's not good news, at least for most people. Most of us realize we fall short, we need mercy. The good news is that Jesus provides that mercy and forgiveness that we need. He, he guarantees us a place in eternity, not because of what we do, but because of what he has done for us. That's good news for everybody. Legalism says that if we obey God, he's obligated to save us. The gospel says that God wants to save us even though we fall short. God's not under any obligation to us. But the gospel presupposes that we don't want to fall short. It includes repentance. When people realize that God is smarter than we are and that he loves us, then we're going to want to do what he says. The creator knows more than we do about how to live in love, joy, and peace. And he's given us these instructions for our good. It's not legalistic to say that we should obey God. Uh, we just don't want to think that this obedience earns us a place in eternity. That's not its purpose. Well then, what is its purpose? <laughs> Why should we obey? Uh, well, for one, it's a smart thing to do. <laughs> God is the author of life. He has a lot more experience with it than we do. He knows how he made us, he knows what works, and he doesn't, and what doesn't, and he tells us to do what works. Uh, he's telling us what kind of behavior helps get along with each other and make a stable society. Now, obedience is also an expression of faith or trust. We trust that God wants the best for us and that he's giving us commands for our good. Uh, obedience is part of a good relationship with God. It shows that we trust him. He's got authority, he's got wisdom, he loves us, knows what's best for us. When we go against what he's told us, it shows disrespect. Now, the gospel says that sin is bad. Uh, we need to rescue. <laughs> we have all sinned, but Jesus has taken care of the problem for us. He, he's a mediator, he's an intercessor. He gave himself as a ransom for uh, to rescue us from slavery. He, he wipes our sins away. The New Testament uses several word pictures to say that we can have a good relationship with God because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Jesus died for our sins. That's essential. But he was also a teacher. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record these teachings because the church needs these teachings. 
It's not so we can laugh and say, I'm sure glad we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and our, if, if Christ wants people to obey, his, his love will compel them to obey. We, we don't need to teach people. Uh, if God wants to save him, he'll do it. Uh, that's what one of the first missionaries was first told. It's, you know, if God wants to save the people in India, he'll do it. You don't need to go there. Uh, but if that's the case, then Jesus didn't seem to know it. <laughs> Matthew didn't either. Uh, basically, whether or not Christ's love compels people, the Great Commission is still the same. We, the church, are supposed to be teaching people to obey what Jesus commanded. Eh, some people are a little uncomfortable with the word obey. Uh, I think that their discomfort is evidence that we, the church, haven't been doing this part of the Great Commission as well as we should have been. Eh, and our denomination's not alone in this. Uh, Dallas Willard says that the Christian world in general, and evangelicals included, have been reluctant to teach people to obey what Jesus taught. He called it the great omission. Uh, we haven't been doing it. Jesus tells the disciples, and through them he tells us, that we should teach people to obey what Jesus commanded. The church of Jesus should be a teaching church. And the people of Christ should be a learning church people. Uh, this is part of what it means to make disciples. It's not some add-on or some footnote. It's part of the message that should be preached in all nations and should be preached in the churches as well. Now, it's not always easy. It, it's not always easy to obey, and it's not always easy to figure out what it is that we should obey. It requires some discernment and some principles of biblical interpretation. And that is one role of the church and teachers in the church. We don't just each of us decide for ourselves what commands we ought to follow and which ones we are going to ignore. We, we come to the Bible not just as individuals but as members of a community, people who seek together what Jesus wants us to be doing. As Jesus reminds us, he will be with us as we gather in his name, as he authorizes us. People who go it alone, who lean on their own understanding, often come to strange conclusions. Uh, when Jesus says, teach people to obey what I've commanded, uh, we include in that commission the entire New Testament. That's what Jesus has inspired his disciples to write and preserve for us for the use in the church. Now, Jesus commands the leaders in his church to teach. In Greek, the word has a progressive or continuous sense, to be teaching, teaching. It's not a just do it once activity. It's an, it's an ongoing activity. We can't teach everything that Jesus commanded in one sitting or even by reading through the four gospels in a week or the entire New Testament in a month. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just information that can be tested with some multiple choice test at the end. It's one thing to teach people what Jesus commanded. It's quite another to teach them to obey. It takes a lot longer and it includes the example we set. It's relatively easy to teach people that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. The words can be memorized in less than a minute, but it takes a lifetime to learn to do it. Teaching is a long-term commitment on the part of church leaders. It implies a long-term commitment on the part of members that we continue to learn. Uh, that we're willing to be taught. The leaders, too, need to be continuing to learn, uh, to be, keep growing in understanding to, and, and a willingness to do what Jesus commanded. So it seems like the Great Commission implies a few more details along the way. Go into the world and preach the gospel of repentance and forgiveness. And form communities of people who work together to learn and apply the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus will be with us as we do it. 
Now, the teaching mission of the church is an international mission. It involves not just teaching members and leaders in our own congregations. It also involves teaching people in all nations. As far as God allows us to go with the gospel, we are to teach. And that sets up a long-term relationship and a long-term obligation to help those that we reach. Now, logistically, we here in Glendora can't baptize everybody who believes, and we certainly can't directly teach everyone who believes, but we can support the training of the leaders who will in turn teach in their congregations and spread the gospel and form more congregations. We are doing this uh, in Grace Communion Seminary. The denomination is giving scholarships to GCI leaders in other nations so they can take these classes and learn more about Jesus, who he is, and what he teaches. They learn not just what to do, but also why and how it connects with the bigger picture of what God is doing in and through the gospel. God is recruiting us, not as slaves uh, who do his work for him because he doesn't want to be bothered with doing it himself. That was one of the pagan views. No, he's recruiting us as family, as children with whom he wants to spend life. And he spent time with forever and ever. He wants to be with us. And that's what the gospel is about. That's what the church is about. That's what ministry is about. Those who serve, who work, are also those who are being served. Uh, The ministers are being ministered to. Uh, We are all being prepared for eternal life with God through the work that we are involved in. Uh, Just all believers are being prepared for life with God through the life that we have with our families, friendships, congregations, as we obey what Jesus taught. We're learning together, teaching together, and growing together by working together. Indeed, if we're not working together to do something, then we're not learning to obey what Jesus commanded. Our work is an important part of the training, and I'm happy that our congregation has a high percentage of members who are involved in ministry. We, we, <clears throat> we simply cannot grow to be more like Christ without participating in the work that he's doing, in the work that he specifically said we should be doing. He wants this work done, and we can't be like he is unless we want the work done too. We need to learn to love the people that he loves. Uh, We need to obey what he says is the second most important command, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, We need to care about other people, not just those in our own families, our own circle of friends, our own congregation. Our mission includes the whole world, and it starts right at home. It's all part of the same picture. We do what we can where God places us, and where he sends us. The Great Commission reminds us that it is his work done under his authority, done in his presence, and we learn by doing. Now, I'm not saying that obedience is the first thing that should come out of our mouths. Hey, neighbor, I've got good news for you. You should obey Jesus. Sign here on the dotted line. (laughs) Uh, No, there's more to it than that, but Jesus is saying eventually it should include that. Uh, The truth is that Jesus' instructions to us are good news. But it generally takes some time for us to learn that. And people usually have to obey for a while before we learn that it's actually good for us. But the Great Commission is not that we teach people that they can obey after they figure it all out. Um, No, we're simply told to teach people to obey. We try to explain why it's good, but if we wait until we figure it all out, we really aren't obeying. The church is to work together to understand how we are to obey the commands today. The rest of the New Testament gives us some guidance on how that was done in the first century, and we look to that example and the continuing guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us obey Jesus today. 
So we might say that the church has a teaching ministry and we all have an ongoing ministry of learning. And we can also say we have an ongoing ministry of obedience. As we do what Jesus has commanded, we are continuing his ministry in the world and in the church. As we do good in our neighborhood, we are continuing the ministry of Jesus. As we care about the people of, uh, around us, we are continuing the ministry of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean every bright idea we get is, in fact, what Jesus wants us to do. Uh, that requires some study and discernment and some discussion in the community. But it does mean that Jesus wants us to be doing something good. He says, for one, let your good deeds be seen so that people will praise God for it. They will not only see good works, but also know that God had something to do with it. And that we're doing those works because Jesus has motivated us to do something good. There are actions and there are words. Actions without words don't send much of a message. Words without actions don't say much either. Our life needs to match the words we speak. And both of them need to match what we see in Jesus. We don't do this as well as we'd like, but that's what we need to aim for and to try to get better as we go forward. We have a message and we have a ministry. And the message is part of our ministry to all the nations. And doing good is part of the way we convey the message. Words and deeds go together, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment working together. It's all part of the package God is using to prepare us for eternal life with him. It's good news and good works, and it's good. <laughs> now, one of the things that Jesus commanded is that we use food and drink. <laughs> to remember what he has done for us. And part of our job is to teach people to obey this particular command. He said in Matthew 26 and verse 26, uh, Matthew, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. And in verse 27, he says, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. And Luke tells us that Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say, Do this if you understand it. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that the disciples did not understand what he was talking about at the time. But he told them to do it anyway. Uh, whether they understood it or not, whether they thought it was a good idea or not, just do it. If you want to be with Jesus in eternity, just do it. <laughs> that includes you folks watching online, too. Uh, if you want to follow Jesus, just do it. Uh, now, I think that the bread and the drink have an important symbolism, and there are good reasons to do this in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. We've covered that in various ways in other weeks. But my point today is more basic, and it's just this. Whether we understand it or not, we're supposed to do it. That's something Jesus has commanded his disciples to do, and therefore, in obedience to the Great Commission, uh, they taught their disciples to obey it. And from the very beginning, it was part of the worship of the early church. So let's do it. <laughs> let's take the bread in remembrance of Jesus' body broken for us. And let's take the juice or wine in remembrance of Jesus' blood shed for us and our forgiveness. May we grow in our obedience of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.